Kurt Schilling is one of the most controversial figures in the baseball world. His career spanned 20 years with 5 teams and included 3 World Series rings, 4 Cy Young candidacies, and 3 300 strikeout seasons. His combination of longevity, a sky-high peak, and postseason heroics should be more than enough to earn him a spot in baseball's Hall of Fame. But it's become all but certain that Schilling isn't getting into Cooperstown without buying a ticket. Whether you agree with his opinions or not, it's clear that the main thing keeping Schilling out of the hall is his big mouth. Since retiring, he's been involved in a seemingly never-ending string of controversies, from scamming the taxpayers of Rhode Island out of $75 million to tweeting his way off ESPN, the brash righty lost a lot of the goodwill granted to him while he was still playing. This video is mostly about his playing career, but it also covers everything he's been in hot water for since, with the goal of answering one question. Does Kurt Schilling belong in the Baseball Hall of Fame? But first, this video is sponsored by HelloFresh. Listen, we only have so many free hours throughout the week, and you don't want to spend that time in the grocery store. With HelloFresh, you can skip those long checkout lines and spend more time doing the things you love, with delicious chef-crafted recipes delivered right to your doorstep. HelloFresh's pre-portioned ingredients and easy-to-follow recipe cards mean that you can get a delicious, home-cooked dinner on your table without all that time-consuming meal prepping and planning. As a college kid, I know a thing or two about getting bored eating the same meals over and over. HelloFresh now has 40 weekly recipes to choose from, so you'll have a variety of new options to try every week. But don't just take it from the HelloFresh YouTube ad reads talking point list, take it from me, your beloved and trusted creator. HelloFresh sent me some meals to try for myself. The Monterey unfried chicken with potato wedges and carrots was my favorite, and all three of the meals were tasty and easy to make. As someone who eats dinner late at night while editing this crap, Having a great meal, portion to cook makes things so easy. It's time-saving, delicious, and cheaper than that takeout that I know you are about to order. Go to HelloFresh.com and use code NTHATSBASEBALL65 for 65% off plus free shipping. That's 65% off and free shipping at HelloFresh.com with the code NTHATSBASEBALL65. Thanks for the food and money, HelloFresh! Kurt Schilling was just the fifth Alaskan-born player in league history when he made his MLB debut for the Orioles on September 7th, 1988. He went seven strong against the Red Sox, the team that drafted him back in 86 and traded him just a few weeks prior. The fireballing righty was a touted but raw prospect, and although he had a strong first showing, he was still years away from being a dominant starter. He earned his first full-time role in the bigs as a reliever midway through 1990, and he was excellent, but the Orioles had pitching prospects to spare and they wanted to add a veteran bat. Schilling was originally traded to Baltimore with Brady Anderson for Mike Boddicker. Had the Orioles kept him, it would have been an absolutely lopsided deal. But instead, they shipped him off to the Astros in an even more lopsided deal. The O's sent Schilling, Steve Finley, and Pete Harnish to Houston for Glenn Davis. No, Glenn Davis, the first baseman. Uh, there we go. Houston received three future All-Stars while Davis hurt his neck so badly that he barely played a full season's worth of games with Baltimore before retiring. It's widely considered the worst trade in Orioles history, maybe even in league history, but you and me both know that Houston was far from Schilling's final destination. Alrighty Astros, you've got a Hall of Fame talent on your hands and he just had a solid season out of your bullpen. Do you A, develop him as a starter, B, keep him as a decent reliever, C, trade him for a solid hitter, or D, trade him for a dude who won't play a single game for your team? Congratulations, it's D! Kurt Schilling was traded again, this time to the Phillies for Jason Grimsley in return. If any of you even know who Jason Grimsley is, it's probably because he once broke into an umpire's locker room, Mission Impossible style, to steal Albert Bell's corked bat during the middle of a game. He did not spend one single day on the Astros roster before being released. It's really easy to rip them now but Houston did have some reasons to move on. Schilling showed up to camp nearly 20 pounds overweight and battled tendonitis throughout the spring. Astros management saw him as a work in progress with a poor work ethic, and he was out of minor league options, so they moved on from him just days before the 92 season. Schilling started the year as a setup man in the Phillies bullpen, overhauling his repertoire behind closed doors. He added a changeup, reworked his curveball, and swapped his sinker for a four-seamer. He started using his fastball up in the zone and worked off it with his splitter. On May 19th, Schilling started his first game since 1989. 
throwing six shutout innings against, you guessed it, the Astros. It was his first of 26 starts on the season, including 10 complete games and four shutouts. Nobody has recorded 10 complete games and 10 games finished out of the bullpen since. Schilling led the Phillies rotation with 34 starts in 93, and although he wasn't as sharp as his breakout campaign, he helped Philly to their first postseason appearance in a decade. The Phillies won game one of the NLCS behind Schilling's 10 strikeouts and eight innings of two-run ball. He nearly replicated that performance during Game 5, which earned him series MVP as the Phillies took down the Braves on their path to a pennant. He struck him out! And the Philadelphia Phillies have won the National League pennant! Although he lost Game 1 of the World Series, he redeemed himself in Game 5, pitching a complete game shutout on the brink of elimination. The 1993 postseason put him on the map nationally, but not just for his gutsy pitching. Cameras caught Schilling with a towel over his head, unable to watch whenever Mitch Williams pitched. The Phillies' closer was wild on the mound and had a reputation for working into and out of trouble, but Schilling's public lack of confidence in him was seen as disrespectful. Once Williams was traded after the year, the two exchanged insults publicly, and they still have beef to this very day. Had Williams shut the door during Game 6, this incident probably would have been forgotten, but we all know how that series ended. Here's a pitch on the way, a swing and a belt! Left field, way back, Blue Jays win it! Touch them all, Joe! You'll never hit a bigger home run in your life! In the 14-year window from 1987 to 2000, 1993 was the Phillies' only season above 500. They were the ultimate flash in the pan. And for a while, it looked like Schilling was no different. A bone spur in his elbow derailed his 1994, and a labrum tear did the same in 95. But 1996 proved that Schilling was still the same guy as he was before injury, if not even better. He capped off the year with 7 complete games in his last 11 starts, finishing with a 3.19 ERA in nearly 200 innings. The Phillies extended their ace through 2000 with an option for 2001. Schilling's next two seasons were absolutely Dominant. In 1997, he broke Steve Carlton's Phillies record and J.R. Richards' NL Righties record with a league leading 319 strikeouts. For his efforts, he finished 4th in Cy Young voting and 14th in MVP voting. He also kicked off a few traditions, including his first All Star appearance, his first time dominating the Yankees, and his first time demanding a trade. The Phillies went 4-22 and in June, and three of those four wins were started by Schilling. He was rightfully frustrated, and he publicly demanded a trade to a contender, but the trade deadline came and went, and Schilling remained a Philly. And his 1998 might have been even better. He threw 15 complete games, struck out 300 batters once again, and finished with a 277 FIP in nearly 270 innings. After the season, he again pushed for a trade. He enjoyed playing in Philly, and he liked the Philly fans but the team didn't look like it would be contending by the time his contract was up. But again, he remained. The first half of 1999 was much of the same. Schilling started the All-Star game at Fenway and publicly called for ownership to sell the team, but this time, the Phillies had a fighting chance. On August 6th, the Phillies were just five and a half games out of the East. It was the closest they'd been to contending since 93. The very next day, Schilling got shelled. He allowed seven earned runs while pitching through shoulder inflammation. He tried coming back a few weeks later, but it was too little too late, and the Phillies lost 28 of 35 down the stretch. After an off-season surgery and months of rehab, Schilling clearly wasn't himself to start 2000. His fastball was sitting in the high 80s and low 90s, and he had an ERA over 6 through 8 starts. But that didn't deter him from demanding yet another trade. He gave the Phillies a list of 6 teams that he'd waive his no-trade clause for. Lo and behold, after a few bounce-back starts, the Phillies granted his wish. Kurt Schilling was a Diamondback playing at the stadium just 20 minutes away from his old high school, Arizona extended him through 2003 with an option for 04, and he paired up with Randy Johnson to form maybe the greatest rotation duo ever. In his first full year with Arizona, Schilling threw over 300 innings across the regular and post seasons. He led the NL in wins, innings, and strikeouts per walk made his fourth all-star team, and finished second in Cy Young voting to the team's other ace. But that was nothing compared to what he did in October. 
In the NLDS, he threw a Game 1 shutout and earned a complete game victory to clinch the series in Game 5. His only NLCS start was a complete game, 12 strikeout victory, and in each of his 3 World Series starts, he went at least 7 innings and allowed a total of just 4 runs. In the end, he was named Co-World Series MVP with Johnson and won his first ring. Schilling's 2002 was his best regular season. He struck out 11 batters per 9 while leading the league with the fewest walks per 9, resulting in over 9 f war on the year. Johnson won his 4th straight Cy Young, with Schilling again finishing 2nd, but the Cardinals got their revenge in October, sweeping Arizona in the division series. An incredibly talented Diamondbacks team went to waste in 2003, as both Schilling and Johnson missed significant time with injury. They still had plenty of talent, but ownership decided to drastically cut cost, and Schilling saw the writing on the wall. He again waived his no trade clause to join another contender, this time returning to the team who drafted him. The Red Sox were coming off one of their most crushing defeats in franchise history. They had a Yankees sized hurdle to clear to break the curse, and what better man to do the job than Kurt the Yankee Killer. The Yankees had been a rumored destination for Schilling for over half a decade, so Boston got out in front of their rivals and triggered an arms race. In response, the Yankees added Kevin Brown and Gary Sheffield, so Boston moved all in for the league's best player. But the A-Rod trade was blocked by the Players Association. A few weeks later, later, he was also in pinstripes. Even with Schilling and Pedro fronting the rotation and Poppy and Manny anchoring the lineup, it felt like the Red Sox were always playing catch-up. Schilling had another Cy Young runner-up regular season, but that didn't even matter anymore. All that mattered was October. The Sox made quick work of the Angels and the Yankees cruised past the Twins. Everyone knew a rematch was in the cards. It was destiny, and in the roaring house that Ruth built, Kurt took the ball for Game 1. Schilling had a torn right ankle sheath, and he didn't look like the Cy Young candidate that he'd been for six months. The Red Sox fell behind the series 3 to nothing, but just barely stayed alive, coming away with back-to-back -back extra inning victories in games 4 and 5. Nobody had ever come back in a series down 3 to nothing, but a game 6 victory would swing momentum heavily in Boston's favor. Only one problem. They had nobody to pitch, so Boston's team doctor sewed Schilling's skin onto the ankle sheath to stabilize the tendon, a procedure that had never been done before in the bigs. The most important game in Red Sox history rested on Schilling's right ankle. Ladies and gentlemen, Kurt Schilling's magnum opus, the bloody sock like scene from the natural, Schilling climbs the mound and prepares to take on this Yankee lineup. Right side, Millar. It's Schilling having to get over and cover with that bad ankle. A feeble swing by Sierra. He strikes out for the third time, and game six goes to the eighth. This performance is too ridiculous for Hollywood. It's just too unrealistic. The scrappy underdog literally putting their blood, sweat, and tears into the greatest comeback in sports history, and it was all contingent on Schilling's performance. Game 7 was decided that night. The Yankees were done. The World Series was also decided. Kirk gave one more bloody sock performance, this time with the words KALS written on his shoe and Boston broke the curse. If he retired after that season, I still think he would have had a fantastic Hall of Fame case. But Schilling went on to win his 200th game in 2006 and a third World Series title in 07. His career postseason stats are among the best ever. Since integration, there are 60 starters who have pitched at least 65 postseason innings. Schilling trails only Madison Bumgarner and Bob Gibson in ERA, and he threw significantly more innings than both. If it weren't for Bob, I'd argue that Schilling was the greatest postseason pitcher of all time, or at the very least tied with Madbum. It's only fitting that his last big league appearance was a World Series victory. With most players, this is where the video ends. His once improbable career was incredible, he went out on top, and a few years later, he entered the Hall of Fame. But not with Kurt.
Poor business decisions, politics, and Twitter are now people's top of mind when they think of Kurt Schilling, and there's no question how it's impacted his Hall of Fame chances. But before I delve into the toxic aspect of this video, I'm gonna set some ground rules. First of all, there's gonna be some politics, but no political bias. I'll present every story factually and leave my own opinions until the very end of the video. Two. Comment your takes, but keep them civil. I want to see discussion and conversation in the comments, but don't harass other commenters, me, or Kurt in the replies. And three, most importantly, subscribe to the channel. Over 90% of my viewers aren't subscribed. All it takes is one click of a button, and I wouldn't be interrupting the video to ask you if it didn't help me out a ton, so I'd appreciate it if you did. Alright, here we go. Unless you already know this story, I'll bet you have no idea what type of business got Schilling into hot water. I'll give you a minute to guess. It was gaming. Kurt Schilling is a gamer, a huge MMORPG fan. Near the end of his playing career, Schilling founded 38 Studios in hopes of developing the next World of Warcraft. Even before 38 Studios developed a single game, Rhode Island offered Schilling's company a $75 million loan to relocate to Providence and bring 450 jobs to the state. And in February of 2012, the studio released Kingdoms of Amalur Reckoning, a single-player RPG to a positive critical reception, with a prized MMORPG in development. But just three months after their first game was released, 38 Studios defaulted on its loan, laid off all employees, and declared bankruptcy. Schilling himself says he lost $50 million on the company, employees never got paid, and years of criminal investigation and civil suits ensued. All in all, the loan cost the taxpayers of Rhode Island tens of millions of dollars. During this whole ordeal, Schilling began working at ESPN as a color commentator, but he took that job title a little bit too seriously when he posted this tweet in 2015, which got him suspended from the air for the rest of the season. The last straw came came early during the 2016 season, and he was fired for ESPN for posting a transphobic meme. Almost immediately, he joined Breitbart News to go on a crusade against wokeness and cancel culture. In recent years, he's hit all the far-right talking points. He's backed January 6th rioters and denied the 2020 election. But to me, his funniest take is on student loan debt relief. This is a tweet of his, verbatim. Your loan is my responsibility? This isn't a loan forgiveness, it's a generation of lazy, unaccountable, uneducated children being covered by hard-working, debt-paying Americans. During his first few years on the ballot, he started off pretty slow probably because voters were still used to Hall of Fame starters all having 300 or more wins. But as the years passed, Schilling gained more and more support- Oh, come on, Kurtz! He, he rebounded after his slight misstep to get within 20 votes in year 9. He then asked the Writers Association to remove his name from the ballot and told voters to not vote for him. He felt as if his conservative opinions were the reason why many writers didn't include him on their ballots, and he was fed up. He wanted to be judged by the Veterans Committee, a group mostly comprised of former players who faced Schilling, as well as a couple of executives and writers from the era. And after his last year on the writer's ballot, he got just 7 of 16 committee votes, falling 5 short of the 12 needed to make the haul. So what do I make of all this? As a Yankees fan who's also on the left politically, I have every reason to not like the guy. But that doesn't mean I think he should be barred from the hall. To me, he's a fantastic ball player with strong convictions, a big mouth, and a public disdain for the people who had a vote. Contrary to what Kurt believes, I also don't think he was blacklisted specifically for his political takes. Mariano Rivera is the only unanimous selection ever, and he's openly a Trump fan, albeit not nearly as publicly vocal. Kurt isn't just a conservative, he's a brash blowhard who talks like he knows everything about everything. You might be taking this video as me relishing in how Schilling has talked himself out of an honor that he definitely earned on the field, but I really do think this discussion is nuanced. There are dozens of racists, abusers, and scumbags in the hall. There are long dead players who actively fought to uphold a segregated league that are currently honored at Cooperstown. Kurt Schilling is transphobic and doesn't really seem exactly fond of Muslims or journalists. I don't take that lightly, but come on, this is a nearly 60 year old white dude who was born in Alaska to a military family, raised in Arizona, and considers himself a born-again evangelical Christian. I don't know what we're expecting from him. I'm just happy he hasn't made his way to Congress yet. Sure, he doesn't like journalists, and he's definitely vocal about that. They've had every right to keep him off their ballots. But if I had a vote, I don't think Schilling's big mouth or massive ego would outweigh his legendary arm and all of his on-field accomplishments. It's not the Hall of Morality or the Hall of Personality, and at the end of the day, I'd probably have him on my ballot unless I was from Rhode Island. 